Bangsalish. Hello, everybody, <laughs> dear guests. Uh, welcome to our session, how and why to involve perspectives of children effectively. My name is Daniela. I am a media policy advisor of uh, Deutsches Kinderhilfswerk, a German Children's Fund, um, and child rights organization. Uh, which mainly works on topics of children's rights and on the fully realization of children's rights in Germany. As member of the Coordination Office for Children's Rights within our organization, me and my colleagues are working on various topics, uh, for example, child-friendly justice and children's rights in the digital environment. We are funded by the um, German um, Ministry of Family Affairs, uh, and therefore I'm proud and happy to realize this workshop uh, with fantastic partners and colleagues and speakers today. Um, our aim is to strengthen the participation rights of children in the debates and discussions of uh, uh, children's rights uh, and issues which affect them regarding the Internet. We'd like to present three good practice examples and after these presentations, you are invited to create an own idea, uh, which might be helpful to uh, think about, the, uh, about involving perspectives of children in your daily work. So uh, let me now introduce our speakers. Uh, at first, um, I welcome Pakamile Kumalo from South Africa, from Media Monitoring Africa, 
and uh, two uh, guys who uh, of youth who came uh, with her. Uh, this is Joy and this is Res from South Africa, and they are going to present a, a project named Web Rangers. After this, um, we have Felix Noller from Designing for Children's Rights, and he's going to uh, present uh, the Designing for Children's Rights guide. Um, at last but not least, Daniela Bayerle from Minds and Makers, and she's going to present um, yeah, her kind of work, and uh, she's going to guide us uh, through, a, through a tutorial. Um, yeah. Thank you very much in advance. Um, so, Paka Miller, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, so, um, I'm from Media Monitoring Africa, an organization, human rights organization in South Africa, Johannesburg. And I'm going to present to you some of the various work we do around child participation or that involve child participation. And then I'm going to be very brief, and then I'm going to give an opportunity to our young people in the room that are going to give their experiences on the importance of uh, a child participation and especially uh, with their experiences and how that has empowered them as young people. Um, so I work, um, like I said, at Media Monitoring Africa. It's a human rights organization based in Johannesburg. And our aim is to promote a, a fair and just society, an ethical and, and fair society where the where journalists or the media uh, 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 promote a fair and just society and the way, the way they promote, we encourage them to promote a culture where they respect uh, 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 human rights and they, they ensure that the powerful are held accountable and that they also uh, respect human rights. So a human rights organization um, and we, have, we do various work and one of our, uh, our, our children's work is called, uh, the children's program is called the Bonabana program. It's uh, a Sitswana word f meaning look at the children. And so with this title and the program, it says look at the children because we want to focus on children. We want to ensure that children's rights and, and, and views and opinions are taken very seriously and they're on the agenda. And so obviously it's, it's, it's an honor to be here again in this workshop uh, at the IGF where we're presenting uh, a, a possible good practices or, or good examples of where children's participation has been successful, where, where we see the impact that child participation has on the different projects around the world. Um, so before we even start, um, the assumption is always that we all know what child participation is, um, but just a quick, a quick view of, of what do we mean from MMA's perspective, Media Monitoring Africa's perspective, what do we mean when we talk about child participation? So child participation involves encouraging and enabling children to make their views known on issues that affect them. So two very important things there. Uh, it's providing an opportunity or an environment or platform where children can make their views known on issues that affect them. So that's the first point. The second point is for, ch for child participation to be meaningful. Adults, so everyone else in the room that is an adult over the age of 18, have to listen to children's views, take them seriously and take action together with children. So what that means is that the adults in the room have to listen when children speak and, and really take their, their, their views and their opinions very seriously. But further to that, after having listened, we have to take action together. So what that means is holding each other's hand when no one is uh, 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 feeling more equal or no one, is, uh, no one is feeling that they have all the power, but working together with children to create solutions that are beneficial for children, that make sense to children. And why is child participation important for Media Monitoring Africa? Because it is a right. And I think we all understand that. It is a right. And this right is enshrined in the uh, UN Convention of the Rights of the Child and the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, all of which, and our constitution in South Africa, all of which South Africa has these two treaties we have rectified. And so that becomes an important element of understanding how we want to solve children's problems, because child participation is a right. Um, and specifically for the UNCRC, Article 12, it says, states parties shall assure to, shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or, her, his or her own views the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child, 
and um, the African Charter on the Rights and the Welfare of the Child, Article 7, says every child who, has, who is capable of communicating his or her own views shall be assured the right to express his or her own opinions freely in all matters to disseminate his or her opinions subject to such restrictions as per prescribed by the law. And so, therefore, you can see that it is really important when we, go, when we use legislation to be able to encourage uh, child participation. Um, that's from MMA's perspective. And in South Africa in particular, why is it important, as, as, it's not just as MMA, but as a nation? Because 35% of the population is ch are children. And so that's a huge portion of our population. And if we, if we intentionally exclude them in discussions and, and platforms where they are able to view and express their opinion, that means that we are excluding 35% of our population, which is then speaks to issues of exclusion. Um, and then we cannot obviously solve issues around children when 35% of the population are not even excluded in conversations around children. Uh, and so that's another really important point. Uh, and looking in terms of your specific countries, um, in, in, in understanding that if once children are represented on in important issues, then you are, those children that, are, that form part of those discussions are a representative of the whole population that fall under children. And so that's really, really important. Okay, so next is what child participation should look like for Media Monitoring Africa. It should be transparent, it should be fair. Uh, it should be, everything should be laid out in a way that makes sense to children. Uh, a lot of times, for, I'll give, give an example, when we do, uh, people that work with children, when we go out on, site, on sites and we do surveys, we just give the children surveys and we, we expect them to complete them without having to explain what the survey is for and what the information is going to be used for. So that's a simple example of being transparent and upfront about all the information that you are requesting or, 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 or needing from children. And so that's transparency. Voluntary, obviously, mm -hmm. always giving consent, and consent with children is always ongoing consent. There's always ongoing consent, and the need to always ask, are you comfortable with this, and are you still, are you still on board with this, and if you are not, then we will stop at any moment. Uh, child participation should be safe and minimize risk. Um, if at any point in any kind of event or activity where you're including children's voices and opinions and there's a possibility that that child's best interest is not going to be of paramount importance, then as a, as, as a child, practitioner, child practitioner, it is your responsibility to ensure that you stop that activity because whatever effort or whatever activity you're doing, it always should be with the framework to put the child's best interest uh, at, uh, on the agenda. It's always on the agenda should be relevant to the child and make sense to the child, should be in their best interest, should be child friendly, should be inclusive. And when we talk about inclusivity, we talk about uh, different, uh, the capacity of different children in different uh, 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 ages, but also children that are differently abled. And a lot of times we don't talk about children that are differently abled and we tend to exclude them from discussions because they are more harder to be able to include in discussions and participation. Uh, and so when we talk about inclusivity, that's what we're talking about, that it is important to also get the voices and opinions of children that are differently abled. It should be supported, this is a very big one and that's why it's highlighted, it should be supported by trained adults. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, people or uh, adults who understand child participation and the approach and the rights-based approach that is necessary when including children's uh, views. Um, it should be, lastly, accountable. It should, be a, it should be accountable to the beneficiaries and the children that you are working with at all, at all times. So that's what child participation should be, according to Media Monitoring Africa, in a glimpse. And how do we do child participation? So we've had experience with working with children and the media for over 15 years and we work with various partners to be able to improve the portrayal, participation, and safety of children in the media, including social media. We have various projects that we do, we do this, um, and we, where we include child participation. The first one is around children's monitoring projects. So we have a project called uh, uh, Child Monitors, or Child Children Monitoring Project, uh, that works to empower children to be able to critically analyze the media to understand how children are represented in the media uh, and how to understand when violations happen in the media and what the media should be doing about uh, 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 or, how, or how the media should be representing children. And so we actually have media monitors that actually look at newspapers and look at media content and are able to then analyze which media platforms are, 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 are uh, adhering to, to standards, ethical standards of, 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 of uh, representation of children, but also media uh, platforms that violate children's rights. 
Um, and when in those accounts where there's violation, the, we have children actually confronting and, and speaking to power to those media platforms and saying, why are you doing this? And this is actually not good practice. Uh, we also have our children's news agency, which is an agency that trains young people uh, on how to report, and they then write for mainstream media. And this directly speaks to power. This directly to speaks to children um, being able to speak to power in a way that is phenomenal, in the way that it, in a way that is very unique. We then have the Web Rangers program, and I won't speak a lot about that because we have our two Web Rangers that are here today that are going to have two minutes to speak. Uh, it's also a, a digital and media literacy program that really empowers young people to be safe online, but also to be critical digital citizens who know how to use the internet responsibly and safely. Then we have, uh, lastly, the VITS accredited course on reporting on children, where we have young people that are coming into the, into the VITS course, the VITS University of uh, Vatvatistan, one of the biggest universities, uh, and they come and they train they become trainers of young journalists and training them on how to report ethically and responsibly on children. And that's really also very powerful because we then we get young people who have lived experience on how they should be treated and they are the ones training these journalists on how to report responsibly on children. So these are some of the uh, um, projects that uh, MMA works uh, and, and we, really, we are really proud of the work that we've done in terms of in involving children in all aspects of our work. Um, I'm going to hand over now to our two uh, that are going to tell us their experiences and how really child participation has empowered them um, as being beneficiaries of the Web Rangers program. All right, um, hello everybody. My name is Joy. So I'll be breaking down what the Web Ranger program is for everybody. So Web Ranger is a program that um, is for learners. What it does is that it equips them with digital literacy. For now, unfortunately, it runs at specific schools or certain schools as an extra mural. So how one would go about becoming a Web Ranger is by going to their school, um, almost like information desk, and receiving a handout where it's a questionnaire based on matters around the cyber realm. You fill that out and then you submit it and then MMA people will look through it and select only 10 web rangers from um, ranging from grade eight all the way to grade 12. And then those 10 web rangers then um, participate to at, where, at workshops which happen um, on selected Saturdays. During those Saturdays, they are then equipped with digital literacy as well as given time to discuss with each other. So other, for example, you have the Sunshine High School um, discussing with the Sunflower High School on what they've learned. Um, perhaps they didn't understand something. So you have the different Web Rangers um, discussing together. Now, Web Rangers doesn't just equip the learners with digital literacy and then leave them. <laughs> they are given challenges that challenges them, of course, to see not only have they gained much from the experience, but it also gives them a platform to voice out their opinion on certain matters that affect um, the cyber world. Um, an example would be the learners after the three, this year we had three workshops, after the three workshops have to create a video about what they've learned and that video gets posted on YouTube informing other people that watch it about um, cyber ills, for example, how to avoid them, how to deal with them and what to do if you are caught up in a sticky situation. So I believe, I strongly believe that um, Web Rangers is very important. Some adults say that um, children cannot be part of big decision-making processes because they don't have the knowledge. But if a program like Web Rangers was part of every school's curriculum throughout the entire world, then there wouldn't be a reason as to why children can't be part of big decision-making processes. So that's my view. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good day to one and all. Now, as Joy has already uh, explained about Web Rangers and what is it all about, I'm actually going to talk about my experience as a Web Ranger and the impact that 
the impact that web ranchers has had in me and generally in other children. Before I was introduced to web ranchers, I knew nothing and lived like everyone in the digital world. But being part of web ranchers made me to realize a lot about the digital world. Now, in web ranchers, we were taught about things like cyberbullying, cyberstalking, online grooming, and catch fishing and defamation, and we were also taught how to prevent ourselves to being in those situations, and if you are in those situations, then how to resolve it. But most of all, I enjoyed being taught about managing your digital footprint, which is the mark you leave behind on the internet or on, online, and that goes along with your reputation online and it grooms your future. Being part of Web Rangers had made me to always think before acting on online, for instance, when I post something, I need to think about it. Is it helpful? Is it harmful? Why am I posting it? Uh, is it necessary? And these steps will make you to uh, end up making good decisions at the end. In general, Web Rangers has empowered children, has actually made children to know what they are putting themselves into, and that has made children to be confident and free in the digital world, which is actually a great thing, and all thanks to Web Rangers for their well informing and educational information. Web Rangers has changed children's lives and has made children to be open-minded and to always think in every situation, and this has made them to be aware of their rights. In everything, reputation is one of the things that matters. So, in short, Web Rangers informs and guides us on how to take care of our reputation, and with that information, as we grow and own our businesses, we will be able to take care of our company's goodwill. Thank you, Shea. Thank you very much to um you three. We continue with Felix. Um, yeah. Thank you, Daniela, and thanks for having me here. Uh, so, hello, my name is Felix. I'm from a um, international and non-profit organization called Designing for Children's Rights, in short, D4CR. In the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, talk about what we do, um, but before I go there, uh, sorry, I forgot to so, no. Um, before I go there, I'd like to highlight uh, why we think what we do is important. So please bear with me. Um, so to start with, I'd like you to think about a child born today, maybe born right at this moment. In which world will this child grow up? What will it experience in the next 10 years? So this child could be Emma. Um, Emma would be, if she's born today, um, 11 years old in 2030, and she will live in a world that is more connected than ever. She will experience technology on a much different level as a child than we did. Um, for example, terms like virtual reality or artificial intelligence will be old hypes by then. There will be new technologies that we can't think about right now. Um, but Emma will also be empowered by this new technology, more so than any child before her. Um, so just look at the children of today and you see what I mean. So there's, for example, Malala, uh, Greta Thunberg, Emma Gonzalez. Uh, they used the internet, more specifically, they used social media in particular, um, to, that has enabled their advocacy and activism to spread globally. So Malala, for example, she started her uh, journey when she was 11 years old and started a diary blog to talk about her daily life on the Taliban rule. Uh, we have Jack on the bottom left um, from the US who developed a new way of detecting a particular kind of cancer just by teaching himself uh, with scientific papers that he found online. Um, so uh, technology for the children born today, they offer great opportunity. But at the still same time, um, not everything is that perfect, not everything works that well. So if you just consider that about one third of all internet users globally right now are children and teenagers, however, they find very little consideration when we design for the internet. We must consider that children as a group are more vulnerable and less resilient to things like dark patterns, misinformation or data abuse. 
We also know uh, that they connect to strangers over the internet. We know they hurt themselves by cyberbullying. Um, and we still, we still know very little about the long-term effects of excessive smartphone use, for example. So how can we protect children? Um, we know there's already great guidance out there. Uh, so for example, I think the best example is the UN's Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, and you know that it's the most spread human rights treaty in the world. It's signed uh, by almost all countries, uh, ratified. Um, and in short, it ensures children with four types of rights. I guess I don't have to tell you that, I'll tell you it anyway. Uh, so these are survival rights, uh, rights to development, protection rights, and the right to participation. And all of these rights are equally important when we talk about technology and how we design technology. Uh, but I'd like to highlight the right to participation in particular, uh, because it touches on two key topics when we create such new technologies. So the first one is that uh, perspective matters. So the right to participation, including children in a process, uh, adds the advantage of adding another view, another perspective that we didn't know before. And the second is uh, responsibility. So who's responsible of giving children the right to actually participate when we create new technologies? We can think about the parents, but it's hard for them because usually they're not the ones that create the new technology. Uh, governments, um, I don't know, CEOs, businesses, usually children, they don't have the money, so a CEO is not necessarily listen to them. Um, so I'd like you to shift our focus um, on designers. And I'd like to quote from a book called Tragic Design, which says that designers are gatekeepers of technology. They have a critical role to play in the way technology will impact people's lives. And that is because designers create a product that embed these new technologies. They design the products that we use and that ultimately children use as well. So designers are not only gatekeepers, uh, designers are also mediators. So a good designer doesn't just design, but usually they involve the user's perspectives in their design process. And a very good designer usually not just involves the user's perspective, but they involve the users themselves in their design processes. Um, so how can we make sure that, well, first of all, what you, what you see here is um, by the pioneer Alison Trun. She's a pioneer in involving children in the design process, uh, and she opened up different ways of including children, including them as users, as testers, informant, or design partners, which involves different complexities uh, when working with children. But I don't just want to talk about how, how to involve them, but actually why and why is it important and what we can do. Um, so we saw designers are gatekeepers, they are mediators, but how do we make sure that all designers know about their responsibilities? How do we make sure that designers have the right tools and know about children's rights and ethical design. And this is where we come into play and what we think uh, there, there's something we can work with. Uh, so we are a group of uh, designers, mediators, gatekeepers. Uh, the picture you see here is us at the beginning of this year um, coming together from all around the globe in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, and where we worked for three days um, on what we think will shape and help shape the design world in a more, um, more ethical way, in a way where we can actually embed uh, children's rights in the design process. So what we do um, and what we did in that three-day workshop, and we did um, one of those workshops last year as well, um, is giving designers the right tools when they design, not just for children, for anyone, but consider the children's perspective in their processes. And we called it the Children's Design Guide. You can find it on childrensdesignguide.org. Um, and it's a way of integrating children's rights and ethics into the design process. Um, and what we want to achieve with this, our vision, is to create a new normal. So we want designers and companies to think about children's best interests and then put them first. And when we talk about that, um, we want designers to um, think about the well-being of children, think about the children's, um, unpack their biggest potential, 
and so help design for a world and help design for a generation that is better than us, um, that is more critical and that has the right tools to be more responsible than us. So let me give you a couple of examples of what this design guide is made out of. Um, it, it has 10 key principles, the first one of which is everyone can use, which is about the right of non-discrimination um, and diversity. Um, and there's three examples on companies uh, that make really good use of this principle. The first one is Toka Boca, which is part of our community. Um, they have in their games, so they, they're creating games, digital games for children, and they take care that every child can design a character that represents who they are or who they want to be, no matter of um, sexuality or race or um, religion. Um, we have a second example, which is See Some Street, which is quite old, from the six, started in the 60s. Um, but they are one really good example and best practice of how they involved multiracial characters. They were also one of the first um, TV series to include a character with autism. Another example, Lego, is also part of uh, D4CR. Uh, they just, and it's very new, they just released um, instructions for blind people, blind children, using braille and voice instructions to build Lego sets. One other principle is help me recognize and understand commercial activities, which is uh, about the right to information. And what we see there right now is that um, lots of big tech companies, they're changing their mindset, what advertising means and what informing children uh, while they use their product actually means. So we have Apple who's restricting how um, developers can embed advertisements in their apps and also collect data that's related to this advertisement and so limit what kind of data is collected from children. We have YouTube that's currently working on restricting targeted advertisement um, on videos that may be watched by children. And we have Lingo Do that has changed their entirely business process. So in, at first they had uh, different apps cross advertising between each other, um, creating a very uncomfortable position for families because children came and asked for buy other apps and so forth. So they changed their business model um, and are now a platform that's ad free, uh, that doesn't target, doesn't do targeted advertisement to children. So um, this is us. We are an open source um, design guide. We are a growing community. We're working together with UNICEF uh, through the whole process um, to bring that guide to life. It's based on, on UNICEF's principles. Uh, we have lots of big companies that are designing the design guide, um, but also implementing it in their, in their work. Uh, like I said, we're open source. We're open uh, for lots of people. Everybody who wants to join us uh, is open to join the discussion. We are also growing. Uh, so we started as a team of 70 designers, experts in children's rights. Uh, now what we did is we spread globally and build local chapters. There's one here in Berlin. We just had a, our second meetup two weeks ago. Uh, we have our first chapter in Tel Aviv, uh, we had our first uh, meetup in London, we had one in Helsinki, there's other chapters growing up all around the globe. Um, so we are growing and becoming more and more people um, and we want to start this conversation, start this movement and we're really happy for everybody who joins um, and helps us spread the word. So feel free to come to me, uh, join us or just have a look at the design guide and spread the word. Thank you. Thank you, Felix, and we continue with Daniela. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So first of all, I really would like to thank the Deutsche Kinderhilfswerk for, um, for letting us support them with the two workshops they run here at the IGF. It was a really great opportunity, and more than that, it was a really joyful collaboration, so we are really thankful for that. Um, my name is Daniela, and I'm one of the designers who benefits from this brilliant work the Designing for Children's Rights initiative is doing. Um, I work for Minds and Makers, and we are an innovation consultancy um, for design thinking and social innovation. 
and um, we work for the private sector but also for the social and public sector. And the base for all our projects and um, the work we are doing is the human-centered design approach. So basically this is our innovation process and it has six steps, but if you want to have it in a nutshell, these are three main phases you would go through. And the first phase is you immerse yourself um, in the user's lives to deeply understand um, their everyday life, their needs, their desires and their aspirations. Then you go to the ideation phase, um, where you identify opportunity areas and create innovative solutions and design prototypes. And in the last phase, um, you bring the solutions to life and implement them. It's a highly co-creative approach and um, where ideally in every step you involve, as Felix said, um, the users with you in this, uh, you involve them every step of the process. In our opinion, one of the most important steps of this um, process is the qualitative user research. And here you can see a model that um, was built by one of our colleagues and friends, Frau kierslesweg fischer from the Netherlands. And what it shows are the three levels of knowledge. And as I said before, you want to immerse yourself and find out about the needs, desires, and dreams um, about your users. And you won't find out about these insights by just talking to them and interviewing them. Um, if you interview them, you will get their explicit knowledge, which is basically what they already have in their mind and what they have thought about several times already, and this is what they're going to voice to you. Um, <clears throat> but in order to dive deep or to dive as deep as possible, you really have to also observe what they are doing because usually it's something else. So if you say something, it doesn't really mean you're also doing it in your everyday life. And as I said before, you really want to know what their aspirations are. So what we do is we work with them. We use generative tools within our interviews, within our qualitative research in order to get to this latent deep knowledge they have, but never voiced before, or never thought about before. So today I brought you a few examples of our work where we involved um, children within the process. And um, this is one project we, um, we made on behalf of Aktion Mensch, and Aktion Mensch is uh, one of the largest um, private funding um, organizations here in Germany. And they asked us to design a kids initiative to raise awareness for inclusion. So what we did is we involved the kids in the research phase because actually they are the experts. So we visited them at home and we visited kids with and without disabilities and we talked to them. But as I said before, we not only talked to them, we worked with them. So we brought along tools that enabled them to work with us on eye level as Pacamilo said before, and um, also help them to voice their dreams and aspirations and also concerns and fears. And usually when you're working with young kids, they are not that vocal about their feelings, but as soon as you're going to work with them in a creative way, they find a way to voice it. And we, as designers, find a way to translate these insights. We also visited schools, and um, for Action Mensch, for example, it's really difficult to reach um, children from educationally disadvantaged areas. So we went to, to the schools because actually that's the only place you can really engage with them because they have to go to school. So we also brought tools with us and worked with the kids at the school. But we also um, tried several um, empathy methods in order to see which kind of tasks and tools will help them to empathize with their friends with disabilities. And this is another project and when you involve kids into the research phase, you're not only involving the kids but you're involving their most important stakeholders and these are their parents especially when you're working with kids in young age. So um, this is an example from a University of Cologne. They ask us to support them during a founding phase of a new school, an inclusive university praxis school. And 
we not only worked with the kids, but we also invited um, all the parents to join us on a co-creation workshop. So these are the parents from the first pupils of this new school. And we worked this with them for a whole day. And also, again, we brought our tools with us. And um, for, our, for us, it was really crucial to support this um, founding team of the new school by not only having the university's perspective and the curriculars, but also involving the children's perspective and especially the parents' perspective. And um, as we saw on this slide, Felix showed, you not only can involve the children in the research phase as experts, they can be designers themselves. So this is a project we did on behalf of Astrid Lindgren School. This is an elementary school and the city of Cologne. And the original problem was that, or they asked us to help them redesign a public square in Cologne. And the original problem was that um, the square was often used by junkies, and not the junkies themselves were the problem because they didn't harm anybody. But unfortunately, you could find a lot of used needles at this um, square. And obviously, that's not ideal, especially if there's an elementary school around the corner. So we went to the school and worked with one particular class of the school for a week. And the first step we did is we asked the children to name their project and give their team a name. And yeah, I'm not sure if the parents would agree, but they call themselves angels. So are they the 18 <laughs> angels for the Alpena Square? And we also asked them to design a logo for their initiative for their project. And um, of course, we came up with angel wings, and then we spray painted them on their school t-shirts. And what that did is that gave this project and the kids especially an identity. And they completely took on ownership of this project and felt completely responsible for the outcomes. And they were particularly proud wearing these shirts. And they really wore them the whole week. We didn't expect that. but. They did. So, um, and again, there was a research phase where we um, went to the square with the kids. They were the researchers themselves. They took pictures. They interviewed people using this um, square and so on. And then we used um, different materials and um, helped them to design collages of the, of the square, how they would imagine the perfect outcome for this square. And in the end of the week, we ran a um, big party on the square, a block party, and invited local politicians. Um, we showcased the work of the children, the prototypes, and um, we also showed a little video documentary we made um, during the week working with the kids. And the kids raised about 20,000 euros from the local politicians in order to redesign this square. And now it's really more of a neighborhood hub than a dirty, scary square. Um, what is now at this square is um, they don't like, did, didn't put a fence around the square, which you would imagine, but they built a huge bench around the square where everybody can find a safe and dry place. And um, as I said before, it's more of a neighborhood hub now. And what studies show is that once Children's are, children are involved in a design process, and you can see that this is the work of children. The chances that these things will be destroyed are less than if you see that it's a professional designer or an adult involved. And this is also what you can see at this square now. And the last initiative I um, brought with you uh, for you is um, on behalf of the International News Service of the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, they ask us to help them design youth-centered counseling services. They already do offer a lot of counseling services when it comes to ex international exchange programs, but what they discovered is that they are not really used and accepted by the youth. So they ask us to help them recreate new services. And again, we um, did involve the youth in every step of the project. And here you can see another collaboration, a co-creation workshop together with the youth. And what you can see here, other than the prototypes you saw before with, uh, from the elementary ki kids, um, these are more of high level and high quality prototypes that are really can be a base for the new services of the youth service of the Federal um, Republic of Germany. So that's 
it about my work. Thanks a lot. And um, now it's your turn. So um, what we thought beforehand is um, that this should be a workshop, and we took workshop quite literally, which means you should work, you should participate, it should be an interactive format. And um, we brought with us um, some tools, and my colleagues are um, going to spread them. And I would like to ask you to join us here in this really comfortable setting. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it's an intimate group. We could all join here in the U. <laughs> and once um, you all have the tool sets, um, I'm going to explain a bit more what, what we want to do with you. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to find out, like, while we're waiting, can we ask questions based on the... Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for uh, the presentations. Very exciting, really. I wanted to find out... Um, the research that's being done, how, is that, how does that feed back to the various companies, the tech companies, for example? Do you actually have communications there? The second question I have is around the parent-teacher uh, sort of workshop, I mean, parent-child workshop that you led, found that very interesting. In a previous workshop that I attended, it was quite apparent that teach, um, parents were not as clued up as the, as the students or as the children, like what type of nuances did you pull out there? Were there any clashes in how the parents viewed safety, for example, compared to children? And how did you work around that? And then the question is for Felix about the chapters. Um, how, do, like, how can other countries set up chapters like your organization? Thank you. I'm so sorry, I didn't get the last part of your question concerning the workshop with kids and parents okay yeah. so I was just trying to understand um, how did that work how did that work out so what were the findings from the parents perspective yeah. versus the findings from the children yeah. right yeah. because in a workshop that we attended it was very clear that parents are not as clued up as the children are in most cases and they themselves the parents that is you know are still trying to figure out what what is tech and all of these things yeah. so I'm trying to understand what were the differences and then mm -hmm. In cases where there were differences, how did you guys collate that information? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this specific case, um, this was a workshop only with the parents. So beforehand, we had the work with the children, and then this was just a day for the parents. And I think that was crucial, because then they were also able to voice their concerns. They wouldn't do that when the, when the kids are around, because they want to be brave. They don't want to concern the kids themselves. So I think that was a crucial part for the workshop that it was only the parents and to be honest there weren't so many differences between the concerns the kids had and the parents had but the parents as I said before they didn't voice them to the kids so the kids didn't know that the parents had the same concerns they, as they had and I think that was also a learning for the school that they don't have to separate them actually because they they have the same concerns already. So um, I think what they then, um, they um, created something like an, an, I don't know how, how you to translate it. And it's like an, an open hour where kids and their parents can come together and they talk about the everyday ongoings in the school and things they want to improve, but then the children and parents are together with the, student, uh, with the, yeah, with the students from the university, with the teachers and, and the, um, the head of the school. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, usually, um, as I said before, it's crucial that um, the users, but also the stakeholders, are part of every process. So what we love to do is take our clients, if you may so, um, with us to the research. So they join us on the interviews with the kids, they join in the workshops, they join when we talk with the parents. So like the translation into the company isn't that hard anymore because they were part of the whole process. Obviously not everyone, a specific team. And we find it really useful to show videos, to show photos, not only show a PowerPoint presentation or an Excel slide with some numbers, but rather show um, voice clips of the research and videos. Is a re videos are a really nice format to, trans 
to translate and transport um, the insights into the companies. Cool. Um, so to your question, how you may set up a local chapter. Um, the chapters are quite new, so we don't really have a process yet. We are working on a handbook currently so that other people can build up chapters as well. If you're interested in building a chapter, it would always be nice, first of all, to have a group of people, at least two or three people, I think. Um, but then also be part, or uh, if you took part in another event, another D4CR event, to have some form of connection um, so that you know um, like the advocacy that you, that you, that you take on. Um, but if, you, if you're interested in opening a chapter, if anyone else is interested, um, please come and talk to me. Um, I can make the right connections and tell you how we did it, how we started our chapter here in Berlin. Um, also, we may host, so we host different local events, but we may also host another bigger event where we invite all interestees from all around the globe to join us. Um, so if you follow us on LinkedIn, I guess, or Twitter, uh, you will get to know when these events happen and then feel free to join. Um, some of these events are limited in, in space, so you would need to have to apply. Um, but yeah, that's the way on how to learn about it. If you would really like to build up a chapter, then come talk to me and I'll give you some advice on how we did it. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. So by now you all might have, oh, you're leaving because we're working now, yeah? <laughs> okay, sorry, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. it's okay. <laughs> Just leave. <laughs> so as I said before, it's a workshop. So, um, and we thought we'd be talking about, a lot about participation and involvement and collaboration and gaining different perspectives. So we thought uh, we would might, uh, we might present you some tools, how to use this in your everyday life. And what we want to ask you is to design a digital service or product that motivates children to brush their teeth. This is your task for now. And what we did is we ran a little research beforehand and one of the results of a research might be a persona, which you find in your tool set. You find a description of what a persona is on this tool set and we designed this persona already for you usually you would do this yourself but we provide we prepared this for you already and what we would like you to ask is um, to based on this persona uh, come up with opportunity areas for this specific design challenge the next page you see a template for opportunity areas. So, um, and it also explains why opportunity areas are quite important in the design process. And we have this nice example of Pippi Longstockings, who is like a really brave child, but she still is sad because she misses her dad. And usually the solution would be her dad has to stay at home and so she won't be sad anymore. But if you're working with opportunity areas, you will create how might we questions in order to solutions. So one of the first how might we questions in this example is how might we make it possible for Pippi Longstockings to have regular contact with her dad so she doesn't feel alone? Or how might we give Pippi the feeling of not being alone by finding a father-like figure? Or how might we enable Pippi to visit her father? So in our, in, when you open up this how might we question, or when you create this how might we questions, you open up opportunity areas for, for innovative ideas rather than jumping to the first solution by answering the problem. So what we want you to do is come up with a few how might we questions based on the persona we give you. And then, based on these how might we questions, we want you to come up with ideas and initially one idea concept for a digital product or service for 
children, to innovate children, to brush their teeth. And I guess it's more fun if you join someone, team up with your neighbors maybe, and then work collaboratively uh, on these tools. And uh, my colleagues, we are happy to join you, jump in and uh, give you some ideas or give you some explanations of the tools or answer questions. But we really would love to see you working in this workshop. So go ahead. <laughs>
So, how are you doing? <laughs> are there any brilliant ideas yet, or do you need some more time? Yeah, or I see lively discussion. That's a good sign. Seems to work. <laughs> are there any ideas you want to share? I know, I already talked to him. He's a really good student. <laughs> Do you want to? Please. All right. So our idea was to create an app to target Charlie's frustration of not being able to finish what he started. So like a completion sort of percentage sort of thing that has Spider-Man. Um, and perhaps Lego Spider-Man to con target both of his interests there. Um, and then perhaps the app is set on a timer to do it right after dinner so it doesn't interrupt his playtime and it disassociates from um, uh, brushing your teeth, meaning fun time is over, meaning it's bedtime, so just moving it up, I don't know. Um, so scheduling, and then if we can throw in some way to make the toothpaste taste like pancakes, then added bonus. <laughs> Now you can So I already found a flaw in mine, but I'm still going to present it. Um, so I noticed that he loves being on his skateboard, so I took that. So I still, um, so what you do is we buy him a simple and plain skateboard. Every time he brushes his teeth, we tell him, you're gonna design the skateboard, you're gonna make it your own, like decorate it, customize it, so that it's your own. Every time you've brushed your teeth, you only get one element to design it. So there are 12 colors, for example, if he wants to color it in with Sharpies, there are 12 colors. So after brushing his teeth, he only gets one after two weeks. He has to do it for two weeks. So it's like a two week period. And if he needs like stickers, after two weeks of receiving 12 colors, he'll then get the stickers. If he wants ribbons, after two weeks, he'll then get the ribbon. The flaw that I found is once he's done designing his skateboard, how are you going to keep him interested? So, yeah. <laughs> Could we have the slides again? I'm sorry. I don't want to see myself. <laughs> so. So um, we would be really happy um, to hear your feedback and afterwards there's going to be still time for a Q&A session and we brought um, with us a structure for the feedback. So if you want to give us feedback, we would, um, it would be nice if you could phrase it like I liked, I learned, I wish with these three points and then uh, we could go to the Q&A sessions. Thank you. Okay, if there's no feedback, are there any questions? Oh. So, I like the fact that I got the opportunity to present web ranges. I learned that um, speaking to a crowd of people is actually fun and <laughs> adults will actually listen to you. And I wished I could um, like be part, like do this job every single day, so yeah. Okay, thank you very much. If there's no other um, wish to feedback uh, this um, little session or lesson, uh, we would like to open the space for 
some questions you might have on these presentations or something else. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, can I mix my own, own opinion to the, uh, the issue instead of a question? <laughs> because I have some thoughts to speak out, maybe. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. I'm from Hong Kong uh, I'm an iFocus ambassador. So in case if you would like to know more about iFocus, feel free to talk to me or my partner after the session because I'm afraid I will be, uh, it will be running out of time. So. Uh, anyway, so uh, regarding to the today's topic about uh, child children's participation to uh, to the issue, uh, in my opinion, there is one very key point that it's called fairness. So fair is a very important uh, concept in the whole issue. So let me explain this with the three-layer uh, structure, perhaps. So uh, the first layer is that they have to get a chance to actually get in touch into technology. So uh, me, myself, or anyone here sitting in the room are actually the lucky ones, because we have the chance to get in touch or use phones. We have cell phones, we have mm -hmm. iPads, we have all the technologies, we have projectors, everything. We are the lucky ones, but not everyone is as lucky as we are. So, uh, well, maybe from Hong Kong in my home city, we're lucky, but in countries like, uh, I'm not sure, but maybe Africa, in some African countries, we're not as lucky, they're not as lucky as we are. So uh, the first step is to allow them to get in touch with technology first, because if they don't have the chance, they can't do any contribution to the whole thing. So probably this is something that we have to do first before actually uh, allowing them to have chance to speak out. So um, the second layer is uh, a chance to express their own opinion. Because uh, take myself as an example, uh, if I have any questions or uh, opinions to uh, the internet, if I'm not invited to hear, I don't have a uh, a source or a way to speak out because I don't know how to speak out, right? I, if I tell my parents, what can they do? They can do nothing. And I don't have a media to tell others what I want to say or what's my view, so I can't participate in the whole issue. So uh, the chance to speak out is actually very important as well. So if you have a chance to get in touch into technology, then you need the chance to speak out because if you don't, you simply can't to let others know what you think, and they can't do anything about it. So uh, after having chance to speak out, the third layer would be the awareness of students, because uh, actually many students or children are not really well aware of the internet issue. For instance, even though if they have uh, surveys or interviews to do, they might not take it serious because they don't know that their voices are important. They're not well aware of it, especially for children, uh, primary children or smaller children. They don't know that they, their voice means a lot to us or everyone here. So they have to be, their voice have, they have to be aware that their voices are important and will be contributed to the society. So uh, yeah, this is the third layer and they have to know what they're be, they'll be doing because you give them an interview and they don't know that what their opinions will become. Maybe it's, it's for nothing, they don't know about it. So they have to know why they're, they're doing this and what will be the consequence of uh, saying out all the voices. Oh, they, if they know that uh, their voice will be accepted or will be listened by all of us sitting here or uh, participating in the IGF, they will be more motivated to uh, speak out their own voice. So. Uh, getting back to the uh, main concept, fairness is very important because you need to have the equal, equal chance to use technology and to speak out so that they, their voice can be raised out. So I think these three layers are more of what we have to do in order to raise children's participation to the whole issue. Thank you. I just heard there's an um, online question from an online participant. Um, Ruben is saying thank you. We would like to know the panel's position regarding the UNICEF state of the world children, 2017 children in a digital world. 
uh, that governments and private sector have not kept up with the game-changing piece of digital technologies, exposing children to new risks and harms. The UNICEF reports also examine how the Internet increased children's vulnerability to risk and harms, including by, mis uh, by misusing their private information and accessing harmful content. The UNICEF report presents current data and analysis about children online usage, the impact of digital technology on their um, well-being, digital addiction, and the possible effect of screening time and on brain development. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The first part, he, uh, the more specific part, he would like to know the panel position regarding UNICEF state of the world children 2017. Children in digital world, the government and the private sector have not kept up with the game-changing piece of digital technologies exposing children to new risks and harms. Um, so. I, I personally don't have, uh, uh, I haven't reviewed the, 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 the document that is in question, but I think we all are unanimous in, in, in knowing that more needs to be done around protecting children online. Um, and efforts like these, uh, along with uh, what we spoke about earlier, our web ranges program in particular, are all geared uh, towards ensuring that young people are safe online. But also more than that, that they become critical citizens that understand the balance between online and offline, that understand that um, spending half of your day on your cell phone, on WhatsApp is not probably the most productive time, use of your time, uh, that understand the, posit the positive use of the internet, just like uh, the young people that you mentioned in your presentation. I think we all understand the importance, the importance of, of, of having those discussions at a global level like this in order to, be, to bring awareness um, and, and also reinforce uh, documents like the, the document by UNICEF in understanding our responsive, our, our collective responsibility in ensuring that young people are safe online. Can I, can I add to that? Um, and maybe also go to your point of regarding, regarding fairness. Um, I think we don't necessarily have to wait for governmental or public processes to work and embed children's rights um, in when we create products. And I think uh, specifically, I mean, consider, I think Germany took 30 years till the debate for them to include uh, children's rights in the federal law. Uh, it still hasn't happened, they're still debating. Um, but I think these are really long processes and I think there's other people that are um, have a quicker way of reacting. There's, uh, I mentioned the designers, but there's the companies, there's the people that build the products, there's the economy. Um, they are in a responsibility as well and we can start there because the processes work much quicker and if there's any way of helping them, giving the right tools, um, creating the awareness that children's have, children have rights to, uh, which I think is very often not there, that they don't have access to certain technologies, um, that we may have to give them access, not just to the technologies, but to the way of how we create products, how we create technologies, uh, so children can also feel themselves hurt, hurt uh, so that we hear them. Um, I think these are all aspects where we don't have to wait for the public sector or for governments to implement them um, in law. Um, I just have a question follow, fo following up to what he said about access. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty aw sort of aware and knowledgeable about web ranges and the advocacy work around online safety, right? But my interest sort of is about um, do you guys know of any groups in Africa who do similar work around children's participation in product design specifically? So web ranges is slightly different in terms of product design specifically. It's more about online safety, you know, how to, to be responsible online, but it's not really about the product end. Are there any examples that you guys could share with us? So I don't know any, um, not yet. That's why we're always happy for people who want to join us. Um, sorry.
Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Hi, so thanks so much for your comments today. Um, my name is Dal from the Canadian Data Protection Authority. Um, and one of the things that we grapple with now is um, how to enhance children's uh, uh, rights and uh, protections under privacy law. Um, and then, uh, as you mentioned, sort of in the uh, Bona Bona project and the work that you've done was um, enhancing the role of consent for children and having a responsible adult be that intermediary. Um, but I'm wondering throughout all the work that you've done or um, through the experiences that you've had working with youth and young people, are there sort of policy or sort of responses that have come to mind or specific challenges that you think um, that you might not know the solution to, but you think from a privacy perspective need to be dealt with differently than a regime for like writ large for all people. Um, so is there anything really specific to children that should be changed uh, for them to, to experience privacy a bit better given you know, um, their inability to provide meaningful consent because of their age? I can't think of anyone, if, if any right now that is related directly to privacy, but um, I know with the GDPR, the right to be forgotten is a big thing in Europe, but we don't have that in, 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 in Africa. And that's, I think that, that's a huge thing, that you guys don't necessarily uh, 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 maybe understand the impact that it has, because you have it. Um, and that for, us, that, that for us would be one of the, one of the biggest ones, I think, because we have situations where young people want to be forgotten, but because we don't have that, in terms of legislation, we don't have that kind of bigger body that is, is able to support that. Um, when you, for example, we have, we, two years ago, I think we had the biggest, um, uh, I don't want to say biggest scandal, it was not necessarily a scandal, it was a young person who had uh, images of herself exposed on, YouTube, on, 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 on WhatsApp and spread like a virus within minutes. And even today, when you type in her name, those images are the, the images might not be there, but the story behind uh, 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 that incident is still there. And this two years is now, and she's going to be applying for university. She's going to be she's, she's going to live her life. And, and it was a mistake that happened once um, that is still haunting her to this day. And so it might not be directly to privacy, but yeah. I do have a, a comment, but not really an answer. Um, I, I've worked on a couple of projects together with children um, regarding privacy, um, but also products on the internet. And what I always found is that children and teenagers, they have a very different view on privacy or um, any kind of data protection. Uh, and they don't not necessarily share our view of it being a huge topic or a huge danger. But they see it as something they say, like uh, at least what I what I what I heard. Uh, yeah, of course I don't share information online. I mean, it's the internet. So uh, there is something that um, tells me that we have to consider these perspectives. And whenever we talk about privacy, not just talk in our terms about it, but involve children's perspective and hear how they perceive privacy as well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to all of you for uh, your attention today and for your participation and your feedback. Um, I'm really happy that you uh, joined our, um, our session and hope uh, you liked it too. Uh, so I want to say thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm. <laughs>